a long sigh filled the foyer of Lady Shultier's city manor, drifting down the hallway and into the courtyard beyond. Ludmilla shuffled forward on heavy steps. The sound of someone's approach turned her gaze from the floor. Good evening, Lady Zaradnik. Good evening, Amelia, she replied. You've returned quite early, today. Much of her lady's maid's time was now spent at the cathedral as she studied divine magic. So far, she could conjure spices and sheets of crinkly brown paper, as well as cast rudimentary healing orisons. With so much of Amelia's focus being on what would supplement her duties as a member of the Zaradnik household, Ludmilla wasn't sure if it was correct to call her a priest or a cleric. There were certainly none that focused on the spells that she did. Yes, my lady, Amelia nodded as she took her bags. We didn't have the usual endless lecture today. A paladin from the theocracy came in to teach us about battlefield healing, triage and the use of support and offensive magic. I couldn't believe how young she looked. Sister Alessia? You know her? Yes, she arrived from the theocracy earlier this week. We had her over for dinner, but I suppose you were stuck attending one of those usual endless lectures. Sister Alessia doesn't just look young, she is young. She turned fourteen last winter. Amelia let out a breath as she climbed up the stairs. And here I am struggling as an acolyte. Did you know she's a mithril rank adventurer? I wasn't aware that she had her mithril rank trial, but I suspect she'll be Oracalcum as soon as they can put together a trial group. I wonder what they feed little girls in the theocracy. Ludmilla smirked to herself as Amelia led the way into her solar. It wasn't a matter of feeding, it was a matter of breeding. After twenty generations of following the gods' wisdom, she suspected that the slain theocracy had given rise to many powerful individuals. What about you, my lady? Amelia asked, it's only been two days since you left for Katza. I thought the journey would last weeks. Amelia reached into an infinite haversack. Her mouth fell open when she found one of Ludmilla's ruined boots. That happened, Ludmilla flopped down on her bed. I was swallowed by an undead mimic. The acid ruined everything. I, I'm sorry, my lady, Amelia seemed uncertain if it was the right thing to say. It was such a good opportunity to appeal to his majesty. Ludmilla only sighed again, resting an arm over her eyes. All she had done was put on a series of mortifying displays. She was a disappointment, to his majesty, to Lady Shultier and to herself. Forget adventuring. Forget the royal army. Unsophisticated frontier nobles belonged in the borderlands, chasing goblins around in the woods. Shall I draw a bath? That would be wonderful, Amelia. Though she had dried herself thoroughly, Ludmilla still suspected that there was still acid stuck somewhere. A half hour later, she was up to her shoulders in steaming hot water, sighing once again. It wasn't a sigh of relaxation, however, her habit of mentally reviewing recent events had risen to torment her. Even after accustoming herself to His Majesty's presence, Ludmilla could barely contain herself. She had to really turn away just to hold a conversation with him. Despite focusing on her tasks to distract herself from His Majesty's presence, the pressure to do daring things to catch his eye remained ever-present. No matter how careful she was in her thoughts, her words and actions invariably contributed to her attempts to appeal to him. Despite Ludmilla knowing what was unsubtly driving her to do this, a part of her embraced it. She wanted him to watch her, and she wanted to be attractive in his eyes. Some reprehensibly indulgent thing had arisen within, telling her that it was all right to feel the way that she did, as unthinkably improper as it was. It didn't help that Lady Shiltier presented her to His Majesty as some sort of appetizer before the main course. Ludmilla was punished for her sinful ways, of course. Like with tentacles. Or more tentacles. But at least it was over. Her equipment was gone and she could no longer fight. Unless she was expected to lead armies in a dress. A light chime drifted from below. She heard the soft steps of one of her maids making her way to answer the front door. Shortly after, there was a knock on hers. Amelia went to answer it, finding Lisette on the other side. My lady, she said, Lady Shiltier has arrived to see. Lady Shiltier swept into the room, her silken skirts whispering over the floor. Taking the time to unwind, I see, she said. Amelia glanced back and forth between them. My ladies, she said, shall I leave the two of you to one another's company? Now that Ludmilla had returned to most of her regular activities, Shiltier had resumed her regular visits. She came by at least once a week, 
be it in Warden's Vale or Rantle. Lady Shaltier being who she was, her visits always led to certain things. Then those certain things led to certain other things, as she was a vampire. Since Ludmilla was now undead and could not be turned, Lady Shiltier stayed until she had her fill of Ludmilla, in more ways than one. You're her lady's maid, Lady Shiltier told Amelia, so you should stay this time. Help your mistress out of the bath. Rather than staying to watch Ludmilla rise from the bathtub like she usually would, Lady Shiltier turned to walk over to her bed. Ludmilla exchanged glances with Amelia as she helped her dry off. Slipping into a woolen robe, Ludmilla went to join Lady Shiltier beside her bed. I'm sorry, my lady. Have you done something to be sorry about? I've ruined your plans to have His Majesty become more aware of my existence. I can't fight. Everything's gone and I can't accompany you anymore. Presumably, they had taken a break so the Sorcerer King could attend to some daily tasks and several other matters. There would be additions to the crew and new preparations made, given what had been discovered thus far. With the conveniences provided by teleportation magic, Ludmilla supposed that her idea of being away on an extended excursion hadn't lined up very well with reality. Considering what had happened and the oncoming changes, Ludmilla was self-aware enough to understand that it provided the now useless noble in the party an opportunity to withdraw from the venture with what was left of her dignity. That being said, what spilt out of her mouth felt like a stream of self-pity and lament over her failure. Nonsense. You're still coming with us once we get going again. Ludmilla furrowed her brow. What was the point? Unless they really did mean to have her lead an undead company in a dress. You've done well so far, Ludmilla, Shiltier told her. His Majesty is quite pleased with you, so why do you think you would be allowed to stop now? H he is. He is, her liege smiled. Lord Eines is especially impressed by your resourcefulness and potential as a commander. It took Ludmilla everything she had to keep from fidgeting at Lady Shiltier's words. Even a tiny bit of His Majesty's recognition made her happy. This much, she was sure she didn't deserve it. Everything must have been said out of pity, but she basked in the feeling nonetheless. Lady Shiltier produced several articles of clothing from her inventory, handing them to Amelia. A dress was draped over a nearby mannequin. Its color scheme was reminiscent of the one she had brought with her to Erantel in the spring, but the design spoke of some unknown origin. Like the dress that she had purchased, the one before her gave off a casually militant feel. Broadly speaking, there were two layers to it. The first consisted of a light blouse with a pleated skirt that hung just above the knee, with thigh-high stockings and evening gloves. The outer layer was composed of a short jacket with sleeves to the wrist and a long, open-fronted skirt that flowed to the calves in the rear. While the inner layer of the outfit was woven from some silken fabric and made to be civilian in appearance, the outer layer was fashioned from tougher fabric woven into thick crepe. The court fashions of noblemen would often emulate the appearance of armor but Ludmilla had never seen it done for a woman's outfit before. Be that as it may, it was clearly still a dress. Am I to wear this, my lady? Of course, Lady Shiltier said. This will be your, gem, how should I say it, default outfit. What you would wear for an outing, be it for casual purposes or conducting noble business. It should be to your tastes, so you can wear it for everything if you'd like. Lady Shiltier handed the pair of evening gloves to Amelia. It appeared that they were going to make her fight in a dress. Will it survive the rigors of battle? Ludmilla asked. Oh, yes, her liege answered. I suppose it may look like a well-fashioned dress to you, but this is magical equipment. Like the uniforms worn by the maids of His Majesty's household, the defensive properties of this dress make it superior to a suit of adamantite plate mail. Additionally, resistances have been included to account for your traits. In front of them, Amelia poked the dress experimentally with a stitching needle. She was unable to work the extra sharp point through the fabric. I see, Ludmilla couldn't quite believe what she was seeing. It's certainly far superior to my ruined equipment. Still, though it might feel strange leading a company in a dress, if it will allow me to continue to serve His Majesty on this excursion. I already told you what this dress is for, no? Shiltier said, there is a separate set of equipment for battle. It won't be ready until later, I suppose. We had it made just now. Ludmilla frowned at Lady Shiltier's statement. Lady Shiltier might have already had the dress in her wardrobe to lend to her, but to have a new set of equipment made, if it was superior to a dress that was in turn superior to adamantite plate mail, 
it would likely take months or even over a year to forge. Then there was the time required to secure materials for enchanting and the enchanting work itself. Just to be sure, Ludmilla asked. You said just now, as in finished just now? Designed, ordered, crafted and enchanted just now. Between all of the steps and triple checking everything, it took maybe three hours? She had no idea about the productive capabilities of the mysterious realm behind the power of the Sorceress Kingdom until now. Could they furbish entire armies with such excellent equipment in a matter of months? A foreign power might be more alarmed at that than the powerful undead servitors that could be seen everywhere, especially considering that it wasn't even close to the limit of what they could make. Lady Shiltia's armor was so far beyond adamantite that Ludmilla couldn't imagine its true properties. Put on that dress first, Lady Shiltia told her. It has quick swap crystals for every piece, so once you set your gear you can just unequip it. If it's what I'm wearing and I unequip it, then all you'll be wearing is the belt with the infinite haversack on your waist, Lady Shiltia smiled. Ludmilla shook her head, walking over to examine the pieces of the dress. Fortunately, the small clothes looked normal. Lady Shiltia seemed to have an infinite selection of undergarments, many of them were quite strange, so Ludmilla worried that she would be made to wear one of those. Are the undergarments enchanted as well? Of course. Enchanted underwear. She was just a destitute noble from the edge of nowhere just half a year ago. With Amelia's help, Ludmilla went about putting everything on, uncertain about the progress she had made. She experimentally unequipped it after fully dressing. She left the underwear on, but aside from that, all that was left was her belt and the items attached to it. The underwear needs to go, too, Lady Shiltier informed her. This armor comes with small clothes. In response, her liege dangled something black before her in both hands. What's that? A bodysuit, Lady Shiltier replied. It's a part of your armor, think of it as an arming doublet. Ludmilla peered at the bodysuit. The black material it was made from was about a centimeter thick and felt spongy between her fingers. Its sleeves went up to the wrist, but the bottom. She scanned the pieces of white plate in black trim arranged over her bed. Where's the rest of it? Ludmilla asked. This is all of it, Lady Shiltier answered. Ludmilla's gaze went back and forth over everything, trying to figure out whether she had missed something. I see folds, tassets and the base, I don't see any quees or chasses. Without those pieces, her legs would be exposed between the knee and the skirts of the base. On top of being embarrassing to wear, there was no protection against attacks on her thighs. You don't need them. I don't? Leg equipment is a single slot, Lady Shiltier told her. All of the armor below the waist fills that slot. What? What? Her confusion grew. That didn't make any sense at all. Once you try it out, Lady Shiltier said, you'll understand. This is magical equipment, much of the thinking applied to mundane items doesn't work. Still, can something be done with the skirts of the base? They only go halfway down the thigh, the moment I move enough in a fight, people will see everything. Magical equipment alters itself to fit the user. This includes maintaining its appearance, so your skirts won't fly all over the place as easily as you think. You'll have to be doing flips or raising your leg to kick someone or something to that effect. I suppose hopping on a mount will show quite a bit off, as well. Ludmilla swallowed and backed away. It shouldn't be a problem if we increase the length of the skirts, yes? I will not allow any sort of sacrilege. She blinked at her liege's sudden outburst. S. Sacrilege, my lady. This set is modeled after something precious left in my care by Lord Perancino. Any alterations are obviously sacrilege of the highest degree. Was that how it worked? If a god left some scandalous article of clothing behind, was it still a divine relic? Did wearing it go from being an embarrassment to a sacred privilege? She would have to ask Themis about such deep theological principles. Then something like shorts to cover the tops of my legs. No. Lady Shiltier's voice was as stern as she had ever heard it. Lord Perarancino's designs are perfectly in line with studies done by the leading experts in advanced armor theory. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this equipment as it is. Who are these leading experts on advanced armor theory? Myself and Albedo, of course. Ludmilla eyed the pieces of equipment on the bed with a conflicted expression. As the armies of the Sorceress Kingdom gained recognition around the world, they would be renowned for their death knights, elder liches, and a certain revenant's rear end. 
Lian would probably call it a potent marketing strategy. His Majesty said it would suit you. He, he did. Her hand drifted out towards the pleated white skirt lying on the bed. Her other hand came up and slapped it back down. Saying that sort of thing isn't fair, my lady. Holding everything in isn't healthy, Ludmilla. If Lord Irons fancies it, then resistance is the exact opposite of what you should be offering, yes? His Majesty likes it. I like it. Even Amelia looks like she's about to gush over with approval. Ludmilla glanced over at her maid. Considering the valiant image that Amelia always attributed to her, how she would feel about the equipment was a foregone conclusion. All those stories about vampires luring their victims into lives steeped in hedonism are absolutely true, Ludmilla muttered darkly to herself. It felt like she was the only one with any sense of propriety left. Well, she could try it on, at least. In addition to everything else, what Lady Shiltier had mentioned about some sort of slot was driving her to distraction. She found that the magical equipment was far easier to put on than a mundane suit of armor. Amelia figured out how to roughly fit everything and the trait of enchanted equipment to magically adjust to fit their user did the rest. The black bodysuit received most of her attention. She couldn't feel the light plates of the armor through it at all. In addition, the material seemed to shape her body, enhancing curves and... L Lady Shiltier, my breast screw. Ah, I included pads for you. Pretty good right? It truly was magical armor. She couldn't wait to present herself in front of his majesty. A black client slashed through the mist, widening into the portal of a gate spell. Through it, issued the telltale tread of metallic death knight steps, but first came a figure cloaked in a rich green mantle. At her sudden appearance, the mists roiled away into the darkness, but the figure's stride was uninterrupted as she lightly made her way along the pier to the vessel awaiting beyond. Several moments later, a half-dozen death knights stepped through the gate. A figure adorned in hooded midnight robes followed after, as tall as the death knights that came before. A tattered stole of ancient, yellowed cloth was draped over its shoulders, with glowing crimson symbols running along its length. In the crook of its left arm, it held a monstrous black tome clasped and bound with wicked ornaments and twisted black metal. Those who gazed fearfully upon it might wonder what evil would be unleashed upon opening its cover. In the grasp of its wickedly gauntleted right hand was the handle of a massive flail. The jagged blades of the flanged head dangling upon its chain issued shadowy vapors as it swayed back and forth like an unholy censer. If the undead beings that came before were death knights, then one could only look to what followed and call it a death priest. A second death priest appeared beside the first, and they joined the death knights as they divided themselves into two columns of four. The grim procession took their places to either side of the gate forming an aisle between them. It was only then that the Sorcerer King arrived, emerging into the stillness of the Katza Plains in all of his dark majesty. At his side walked the crimson-armored figure of Sheltier Bloodfallen. Six vampire brides followed in their wake. The gate silently closed behind them as they made their way towards the pier. Eins glanced at the undead lined up on either side of his path. How did this become some sort of ceremony? In addition to having the new equipment made, he had gone to check if any urgent matters required his attention. After that, he went to the fifth floor to expend his daily uses of low and middle tier undead creation. With the Baroness inquiry over healers in mind, as well as the recent requests by the Royal Army to make other Death Series servitors available, Irons created a couple of Death Priests and brought them along for testing. He frowned over the low effort naming sense of Yggdrasil's developers. There were several types of Death Series servitors available. Each represented a role that might be found in a party, knights were tanks, cavaliers were cavalry, warriors were offensive fighters, assassins were combat-oriented rogues, wizards were arcane casters and priests were divine casters. As if those names weren't lazy enough, someone had slapped death to the front of them all and called it a day. A couple of them did sound pretty imposing, but when one threw all of the names together, it looked rather lame. One leveled fairly quickly in Yggdrasil, so players weren't stuck with their mid-30s pets for long. In this world, however, he was stuck with them for good. Not that it was an explicitly bad thing. In Yggdrasil, the racial skill that created undead resulted in temporary summons. In this new world, he found that he could use a corpse to make them permanent. For some reason, he could not create permanent high-level undead using the same method, but the rest still served for various purposes. 
Heinz made his way forward on unhurried steps, maintaining his regal gait before one noblewoman, one floor guardian, some pop NPCs and his undead servitors. Upon taking his seat on their transport, the vampire brides boarded, then the death priests and the death knights. The six death knights lined themselves up on either side of the hold while the death priests stood with their backs to the mast, facing the bow and stern. As the crew made preparations to resume their journey, one of the elder lich researchers from Ashabonapol flew down to settle on the carpet rolled out before the throne-like couch. How are your studies going? Eins asked. We have learned much, O Supreme One, the elder lich answered with a bow of its head. It is a specimen uncatalogued in this world thus far. What is to be done with it? The gargantuan mimic essentially made up the basement of the tower. It could probably be excavated, but Eins had no idea where to put it or what use it might have. We'll leave it where it is for now, he said. Never mind any harm that might come to it, I doubt anyone will come this far into the region. Once you've sorted out the information gained here, draw up some proposals for how it might be utilized. I hear you, great master, the elder lich lowered its head. Then, with your permission, my colleagues and I will be returning to Ashabonapol. Umu. The undead researcher flew off, trailed by the figures of several others. Ains turned his attention back to the activity on the ship. The Nar was about twenty meters long, so he thought that things would become slightly crowded with all the new passengers. Aside from the area in the hold in front of where he was seated, however, surprisingly little had changed. He looked down to where the vampire brides had set up an area for attendance with two low tables. Eh? Aren't those Kotatsu? They almost certainly were. Just looking at the magical furniture from Migdrasil made him want to go over and sit down. In addition to the two kotatsu, various shelves and cabinets had been installed in the spaces where the deck overhung the hold. The additional supplies they brought with them had all been neatly stored away. Crimson lighting came to life below him, casting a lurid glow that diffused into the mist. With his seat where it was, Eins wondered what he looked like right then. Sheltier, what are these additional arrangements? I originally intended for Ludmilla to act as a lady-in-waiting, Shiltier replied. With her working as the captain of your vanguard, however, I brought in more of my handmaidens to fill the role. The atmosphere here is so nice as well, so I thought they would enjoy it. That naturally led to them bringing a few things. Did their adventure just turn into a company trip? He eyed the vampire brides, who seemed to have made themselves quite comfortable. They weren't really in the way so Ains figured that their presence was a good thing overall. Your consideration for your vassals pleases me, Shiltier, he told her. I hear they've worked quite hard on the transportation network. If the undead truly enjoyed their time here, maybe he could build something. A spa? Or maybe a whole resort? The number of intelligent undead servitors in the Sorceress Kingdom kept growing, so there might be some potential for undead recreation. They would, of course insist that they were perfectly happy toiling away, but they would probably also accept this sort of company-sponsored vacation if it was presented as a form of recognition for their services. Would a hot spring work? One of the ones with different types of baths for different undead. They could add some ping-pong tables. Over the next fifteen minutes, Eins continued dreaming up his Katza resort. Maybe intelligent undead from all over the world would come and visit. But how would they get here? The lands all around were populated by the living who harbored unthinking hatred for the undead. Hmm, that's right, wasn't there supposed to be some sort of strange ship wandering around here? No signs of it had been noted so far. Then again, it wouldn't leave any signs if it was a ghost ship or something along those lines. The sight of the death warrior captain and baroness Saradnik moving about the ship pulled Ains out from his ruminations. It appeared that they were about ready to set sail. The two made their way up to the canopy, and the captain saluted before moving to his place in the rear. The baroness stood before Ains, her forest green mantle of energy resistance drawn tightly closed in front of her. All has been readied, your majesty, she lowered her head. We await your order to set sail. Umu, he nodded. Are your undead forces accounted for, Sir Radnik Dono? They will be marching along the riverbank. This ship is faster than they are so it may take some time for them to catch up if we travel a fair distance without stopping. That will be fine, he replied. As much as I look forward to how you do as a commander with the support of the death priests, there is no need to rush things. Exploration and discovery are to be savored, and we have many days ahead of us. 
Very good, your majesty. Eines felt that he was becoming accustomed to how Baroness Zirodnik conducted herself. She seemed to be faring much better than before, though he still sometimes noticed her subtly masked efforts to manage her reaction to him. His gaze traveled down the line of her cloak, he still hadn't seen what she looked like in her new equipment. Were there any problems with the new magic items? He asked. P problems? The Baroness looked up, no, I was actually quite, um, shocked when Lady Shiltier brought everything to the manor. I guess most people would be overwhelmed. It's more powerful than a national regalia from around here. Eins was still deliberating over how powerful the items they would distribute to the locals should be. The Baroness equipment felt reasonable since she was a senior government official who had not only proven herself in many areas, but also served in hazardous settings. More importantly, her relationship with Shildir meant that her existence was to be preserved. Several of the other NPCs also seemed to hold more regard for her than the average outsider. The same equipment in the hands of an adventurer, however, was far too much. Nearly every item they found on their expeditions would probably pale in comparison. This would, in turn, dampen any excitement over their discoveries and affect the morale of the guild as a whole. Having them strive for the rare showpieces he considered before was likely the better option. Kokaitis commanders would require a certain degree of protection as well, so the matter of equipment became a delicate balancing act. The preservation of key personnel aside, suitable magic items would help members of various government institutions perform their roles. At the same time, however, they couldn't steal the spotlight from the Adventurer Guild. In that case, he said, let's see what it looks like. Visible hesitation came over the Baroness. After several moments, her cloak parted, revealing a dress fashioned in a vaguely militant style. A copy of something Pera and Chino made for Shiltier's wardrobe? In addition to her combat equipment, Eins instructed Shiltier to come up with a defensive set for her civilian work. It would also double as protection if she went to foreign lands as a dignitary. The outfit suited her well and fit in well for what he had observed of court fashions in the region. You included the boots from the other set? He asked Shiltier. Pandora's actor said that they match both outfits, and I agree. Without the metal slurrets of her combat equipment covering them, it did appear to be the case. An upgrade to the boots of striding that the Baroness had lost, her new boots of swiftness doubled one's self-powered travel rate. It also enhanced balance, jumping, climbing and any sort of acrobatics if she performed those. In addition, it provided a modest bonus to her dexterity, which affected coordination, agility, and precision. Three times per day, the item could be activated for a two-minute duration haste effect. He spotted a few more artifact-type items that were also shared between sets, most of them accessories. The mantle of energy resistance also numbered amongst them. There were no issues equipping everything? None, your majesty. Good. Strangely enough, they had never tested whether humans here could wear equipment in every slot that Yggdrasil characters could. That it was possible was simply an assumption since so many other things appeared to be similar. The closest thing was having some lizardmen equip items when they participated in the martial arts experiments performed over a year ago. If there are no problems with this set, he said, let's take a look at the combat equipment. The Baroness silently nodded, then turned around. Beside Irons, Chiltia snorted, and he turned at the sound. Is something the matter? I wouldn't say that anything is the matter, Iron Summer, Shiltia's eyes glimmered as she smiled in amusement. Ludmilla is unaccustomed to using equipment with quick swap properties, so she's paranoid that she'll forget to equip certain slots and expose something delicate along the way. In front of them, the noblewoman's ears turned red. Can, can that happen? Ains asked. As far as he knew, it couldn't. Quick swap either allowed one to instantly unequip an item, or exchanged predetermined pieces of equipment with one another. Presumably, the civilian outfit and the armor set had been linked. When activated, the item's quick swap function would always work as intended. I've never had it happen, Shilti replied, but it doesn't keep her from worrying about it. After what felt like two or three minutes, the Baroness turned back to face him. A slight blush colored her high cheekbones. She threw her mantle open, and her new glaive appeared in her right gauntlet. Even as she stood tall before him, the noblewoman's gaze turned down shyly to the side. She wore plate armor, but it did not have the bulk of the full plate suits that heavy infantry wore. 
Her torso was armored in two parts. The overlapping bands of a segmented placard wrapped around her abdomen like a corset, while a cuirass and backplate encased her chest. A black gorget with silver trim protected her collar and lower neck. The before and helmet of the set appeared to be missing, replaced by a silvery circlet that wrapped around her brow. When the set had been crafted, Ions questioned this apparent lack of head protection. While the undead were immune to critical hits, corporeal undead would still suffer the loss of sensory function if the associated parts of the body were damaged. The answer, however, left him with even more questions and he could only accept that it worked for the time being. Light pauldrons fitted closely over her shoulders and armpits, and intricately articulated counters protected her elbows, granting her a full range of motion with her arms. While her gauntlets and the lower cannon of her vambraces fully covered her hands, wrists and forearms, the upper cannon only covered the outside of her arms. The exposed portions of her arms revealed a black bodysuit beneath the armor. Despite having so many different pieces, everything so far described, aside from the before and helmet, was a single piece of equipment that occupied the body slot of a Yggdrasil character's avatar. Much like how slurettes were worn over boots, hand and wrist slot items could be worn under what otherwise appeared to be a full suit of upper body armor. Her face slot was the cowl of her mantle, which was actually a separate item that improved her concealment skills. Shiltair put forward the notion that, since the Baroness was also a ranger, she might be able to conceal herself even when in the middle of a battlefield. This would in turn give her additional leeway to take in her surroundings and issue orders, as well as making it more difficult to physically detect her if she wasn't fighting. Two of her three miscellaneous accessory slots were occupied by an upgrade to her destroyed necklace and the borrowed flight hairpin. The third was an earcuff. She hadn't pierced her ears before she died and rose as a revenant, so any attempts at piercing them simply regenerated. For the Baroness leg slot, silhouettes, greaves and polines went over her thigh-high boots and stockings. Tacits strapped to her folds hung over both hips. They covered the two infinite haversacks on her belt, turning them into makeshift armored pockets. Aside from the tacits and folds, only a white pleated skirt with frills of black lace was draped over her bare thighs. Functionally speaking, it was an arrangement common to cavalry armor. Wearing the lower body armor of heavy infantry made it next to impossible to ride a mount, and freeing up the legs made it easier to both ride and control one. It also happened to result in the absolute territory that several of his guildmates fancied in female outfits, which was probably one of the reasons why Perorancino had picked out the armor that Baroness Saradnik's equipment was modeled after. Umu, Ainz nodded. As expected, it looks good on you. You present quite the striking image now. The young noblewoman started to fidget at his assessment, though Ainz thought there was nothing for her to be embarrassed about. It was surprisingly conservative for something that reflected Perorancino's tastes. Aside from her visible head and the absolute territory between the frills of her skirt and the tops of her stockings, no skin was visible. Perorancino had some sort of strange theory about certain types being more enticing with less exposure and excitement being magnified as one anticipated the inevitable removal of their equipment. Eins shook away the memory. Why did he always remember Perorancino's perverted ravings while useful bits of information from other guildmates had been long forgotten? Admittedly, Baroness Zaradnik was one of the types that Perorancino had described, a proud young woman who was virtuous, upright and resolute. Even before donning her new equipment, she exuded the same sort of atmosphere. Now, it was immeasurably enhanced. The brilliant white armor with its conservative silver and black trim, along with the wholly attributed glaive in her hand, presented the image of a pure and valiant female warrior. The Baroness bore a striking resemblance to the Princess Knights from Perorancino's expansive Eregay collection. Ah! I think I figured out what the KH in the set's name means. What might that be, Ein Summer? Shiltir asked. Considering this look, he answered, it should be Kishihime, right? Princess Knight. Their gazes went to the fidgeting noblewoman, then back to one another. Ah, that makes perfect sense, aren't you? Shiltir brightened, as expected of Iron Summer. Only the one who leads the supreme beings could understand the thoughts of another supreme being, aren't you? He didn't want to understand. In fact, he was ashamed that he could decipher an acronym derived from one of Perorancino's fetishes. All that was left was the why. Nope. He didn't want to think about it. In the process of thinking about not thinking about it, however, he suddenly realized what it meant. 
he resisted the urge to bury his face in his palm. Still, the image was perfect. Too perfect. Your selection was right on the mark, he told Shiltier. I doubt even Pera and Chino-san could have done better. Shiltier's crimson eyes widened, then she quickly lowered her head. Why your words are too much for this humble servant, aren't you? Eines gave the Baroness a final once-over before directing his vision towards the ruins on the shore. Though there had been some minor occurrences and various learning experiences, they had uncovered nothing of the region's past. The last two days yielded no texts, no items, nor anything at all that might have provided them with a window to its history. There was nothing but dust and rubble. He leaned forward intently, following the river's dark waters until it vanished into the mists beyond. There had to be something, somewhere, and finding it would be their challenge. It's high time we move on, he said. There's a mystery waiting to be solved. As her vessel sailed down the dark waters of the Katza River, Ludmilla stood upon its bow, scanning the way ahead for navigational hazards and potential threats. Katza Plain's vast expanse filled her senses, a tapestry of negative energy woven into the endless mists. The only place where it was absent was in a small area around her, creating a skin-tight pocket amidst the stifling darkness. Whether she was walking, flying or being carried by an undead beast or ship, it always moved to avoid her. She still wasn't sure why it reacted that way. It certainly didn't with anyone else. Be they living or undead, the ambient negative energy floating around various places appeared to care nothing for what they came into contact with. No, that wasn't quite true. The sanctified areas in the Erantal Cemetery did suppress negative energy to a certain degree, and the Erantal Cathedral's hallowed grounds were absent of the patches of miasma that could be found everywhere else in the city. Did she share some similarities to this? Was she a being that brought her own little bubble of holy ground wherever she went? Holy water did not hurt her, and she took no additional energy damage from holy, light and positive energy sources. A holy undead? No, that didn't make any sense at all. Or did it? If she looked at things from a different angle, one could say that the negative energy within the territories under her influence acted uniquely. That she could pinpoint even the tiniest presence of negative energy in her domain even when she was surrounded by the negative energy of the Katza Plains supported that notion. Ludmilla's observations, however, were limited to her domain, Erantal and the Katza Plains. The parts of Calling County that she frequented did not have tangible amounts of negative energy, and she had still been avoiding it during her time in Volkkenheim County. As a former human, she was even more ignorant of the world of the undead than she was of the world beyond Warden's Vale a year ago. Someone, something, or a combination of things facilitated this. Something else allowed it. The world that humans perceive is only a tiny part of the whole, Ludmilla's Aradnik. Ilishnish's words drifted out from her memory. She had little sense of what facilitated her existence as one of the undead. What allowed it was clear to her, however. Sersana held purview over the souls of humanity, so it was by his grace that her soul had been allowed to dwell in a new form. They went to great lengths to identify the practical elements of her new existence, but he said little about what that existence meant or what a revenant even was. She understood the strengths, weaknesses and various physical traits that would apply to her activities, but nothing about its origins or what is meant to be one. Perhaps it was just her placing too much importance on that end of things and it did not matter at all. Or maybe His Majesty knew everything and he was simply starting out by addressing the more concrete aspects of her existence for the sake of her limited understanding. Ludmilla looked over her shoulder, past the skeletal oarsmen, death knights, death priests, and the vampire brides in the hold. Unlike with herself, both the mists and the negative energy of the plains visited its intangible caress upon them. At this point, she felt like she was being excluded from something. The mist of the Katza Plains was said to have a sort of strange intelligence, so it was as if she was being shunned. A pleasant warmth rose within Ludmilla as her gaze lingered on the Sorcerer King. Like the rest of the passengers, the darkness clung to the luxurious fabrics of his regal robe, traced the perfect lines of his pristine skull. Ludmilla turned her head away. She couldn't let her gaze linger for long. A half dozen seconds was the most she could manage. Restless, she took an inventory of her surroundings. Noting nothing new, she ended up looking down at the new equipment peeking out through the front of her mantle. He said that it looks good on me. Her gaze traced over the black and silver highlights of her armor and a hesitant smile crept onto her face. They were the same colors that Themis and Alessia wore, 
the colors of an adherent of Sursana. That the god himself had granted it to her made Ludmilla feel like she had been marked as one of his own. A mixture of quiet pride and girlish giddiness filled her whenever she thought about it. The Ludmilla of the past might have berated her over such an improper indulgence. She wasn't much changed in that respect, but she also knew that she couldn't so easily brush aside her feelings. Small things wouldn't hurt her, as long as they didn't accumulate and carry her off somewhere. Or maybe she was just making excuses for herself, seeking solace in a grey area between right and wrong. In an effort to take her mind in a different direction, she peered down at the all too short skirts of her armor. Not only did the skirt hang halfway up her thighs, but the armor that should be protecting her upper legs wasn't there, or was it? Lady Shiltier was adamant that they were covered, but Ludmilla had no idea how this could be. She looked over both of her shoulders, making sure that her mantle was blocking any view from behind before she lifted the hem of her skirt. The black bodysuit ended at the tops of her thighs, so there was nothing but skin showing all the way to the extended polines and stockings that ended just above the knee. Ludmilla tapped her thigh experimentally with a finger before drawing a dagger from her belt. Then she realized it was mundane and probably couldn't hurt her. Her eyes wandered around, looking for something she could use until they settled on the new glaive in her hand. The barely visible glow of a cool, holy aura traced its silvery blade. Adjusting her grip on the haft, she tapped the blade experimentally against her wrist. As expected, it did no damage. In addition to her new equipment providing a substantial amount of fire resistance, there was a modest amount of energy resistance against what would broadly be seen as good energy attacks, positive energy, holy and light damage. It was enough to prevent any damage from the middle cure wounds, sunlight or holy light spells of a platinum or mithril rank divine caster. The mantle of energy resistance offered a minor amount of resistance against all energy damage, which would foil attempts to wear her down using scores of weak casters, massed alchemical arrows or weapons that delivered small amounts of energy damage like her own. Stealing herself, Ludmilla flipped the glaive over, pointing the blade at her exposed inner thigh. I understand how you must take down there, but a virgin graduating straight to a polar arm is a bit. Startled, Ludmilla unequipped the glaive and smoothed down her skirts. Lady Shiltier appeared at her elbow, the ghost of a smile crossing her lips. If it's too much for you to bear, her liege offered, I will happily assist in relieving your tension. I'm all right, my lady, Ludmilla replied. I was just trying to see if this armor really protects my thighs. With how you go on about it, even I'm starting to think that something might be amiss. Lady Shiltier leaned over, lifting up the hem of Ludmilla's skirt. Her face drifted in close, and then. Did you just sniff? Ludmilla nearly shouted. You can't expect me not to. Lady Shiltier straightened again, eh anyway, you were worried about all the bits that were like that, yes? Your circlet, for instance. Ludmilla's fingers went up to trace the silvery band of metal over her forehead. The piece of equipment rested so lightly around her temples that she would forget it was there when she wasn't actively thinking about it. This makes absolutely no sense to me, she said. How is this narrow thing a helmet? It just is? Shaltier looked behind them, you, come over here. The death knight nearest to them strode up to the bow. It looked down at Lady Shiltier with a question on the ruined face peeking out from the holes in its helm. Lady Shiltier stepped away from Ludmilla cut her head in half, her liege ordered. The undulating blade of a flombage slashed up at Ludmilla's cheek without a trace of hesitation. The death knight's weapon glanced off before touching her skin. The undead servitor reversed its stroke and directed its weapon towards her temple. The blade was deflected into the air. After several savage chops, Lady Shildir raised her hand and it ceased its attempts to split open Ludmilla's head. See? Her liege waved the death knight away, you're worrying over nothing. It's like that for every SL. Lady Shiltier's voice trailed off as the familiar whisper of robes over the deck drifted over the sound of the current. What's going on here? Hey, apologies for the disturbance, Lord Dines. Lady Shiltier turned and lowered her head. Ludmilla followed suit. Ludmilla isn't used to the way her equipment works, her liege informed the Sorcerer King. She had doubts over whether it provided coverage to the exposed portions of her body, so I arranged for a demonstration. I see, well, that's perfectly understandable, the Sorcerer King said. Local crafters appear incapable of creating equipment that works in the same manner. Since we're on the topic, 
Did you have any other questions about how your new equipment functions, Miss Zaradnik? She still didn't know why he called her Miss Zaradnik. Even between nobles of the same rank, one was addressed by their title in public. The way His Majesty spoke to her might have been a way to appear more personable with the common folk, but as noble, it felt decidedly strange. Ludmilla looked back up again, then turned her gaze away. She had plenty of questions, so it wouldn't be a brief discussion. It was extraordinarily rude to speak to any sovereign in the manner that she did, but His Majesty magnanimously allowed her to do so after becoming aware of her circumstances. The Sorcerer King was often exalted for his unfathomable power, intellect, wisdom and wealth. His kind and considerate manner towards her was not something most people would imagine of him. A more fanciful part of her entertained the idea that she was receiving his personal favor, but she knew that this was next to impossible. Idly scanning the river ahead of them, Ludmilla focused on the Sorcerer King's question. I need to understand the limits of this equipment, your majesty, she said. Things will be awkward until I develop a feel for what I can do with it. She ran a finger over the band of metal running over her temple. This, protection, what is it? Is there some simple way in which I can frame the principles under which it functions according to what I'm familiar with? I can't make any sense of it based on my understanding of how armor works. It's true that, in most circumstances, he replied, having exposed parts of your body like this would mean that strikes to those exposed areas would result in more damage. Those susceptible to critical hits especially seek to protect sensory and vital organs, as well as tendons or wings if one has them. There are, however, various things that can complicate matters. The Sorcerer King reached into his inventory, producing an uncomfortably familiar flaming club. He abruptly tossed it at her. Ludmilla flinched as the weapon tumbled end over end, creating a wheel of flame that filled her vision. She wasn't sure if her new equipment had enough resistance to stop the fire damage from the powerful weapon, but she didn't get a chance to find out. The flying weapon struck a shimmering hemisphere mere centimeters from her face. The club lost its energy, weakly bouncing off to be caught deftly by the Sorcerer King. This is something that you'll see uncommonly, he said. Many individuals do not use shields, but enchantments can provide shielding bonuses to their defense. It is a staple abjuration spell for magic casters, but many will have shielding bonuses provided by magic items to save mana for other spells. Equipment with shield bonuses to defense should also be a favorite of two-handed weapon users like yourself, but for some reason, warriors around here don't employ these items despite how accessible they are. Ludmilla had seen the items with the effect he described before, but it never occurred to her that they were of any use to a physical combatant. Shielding spells were generally seen as one of several defensive enchantments that magic casters in the Adventurer Guild used to improve their survivability. The Sorcerer King put the flaming club away, then pointed to her chest. The amulet of natural armor that you wear provides a second type of defensive bonus that emulates the natural defenses, such as a tough hide or shell that many creatures have. It is cumulative with the shielding bonus from your hairpin. You have another accessory that provides a deflection bonus to defense that is added to that. Finally comes the armor itself, with its own contribution to your overall defense. When you put everything together, it makes you very difficult to land hits on. That death knight wasn't holding anything back, and you were standing perfectly still. Yet all the factors that go into its offense versus your passive defenses produced the results just now. As an active, mobile combatant, it will become that much harder to score a blow. If I equip a shield, Ludmilla asked, will my defenses become even better? No, the Sorcerer King shook his head. These defensive enchantments do not stack with other defenses of the same type. Shielding enchantments emulate the abstracted benefits of a physical shield. When one equips a physical shield, only the greater benefit applies. It was no small wonder why people couldn't figure out what His Majesty had described. The cumulative defensive bonuses would only appear as if the opponent was failing to land solid hits, meaning the opponent was unskilled, unlucky or the target was lucky or skilled, and no one waited around for their enemies to finally deal damage to them. The enchantments on locally available magic items were probably not as potent as those on her equipment, so the effect would be far less pronounced and thus harder to discern. Also, he added, while it may provide the same abstracted defensive bonus as a physical shield, it does not provide the other benefits that come with wielding one. Physical shield walls can block area effect spells like fireball, but the enchantment does not. 
You also cannot control incoming strikes as you might with a shield, nor does the enchantment obscure your opponent's line of sight. Attacks that employ shields are also obviously not going to work without one. What about the armor itself? Is it simply the defensive bonuses from enchantments that kept the Death Knight from landing any strikes? No, there's a good chance you'd be shorter by half a head if not for the circlet, the Sorcerer King told her. Naturally, exposed parts of one's body should be more susceptible to damaging hits. The Sorcerer's Kingdom's foremost experts in advanced armor theory have recently come up with certain techniques to achieve the appearance of what you're wearing. Ludmilla glanced over at Lady Shiltier, who only raised her head proudly. Being able to see the face was our first priority, she said. Having the bodysuit as part of the armor is a compromise for now, and we've only gotten as far as you see with the legs. Sooner or later, however, Lord Ines will be able to see Everett. The Sorcerer King coughed loudly, clearing his non-existent throat. A at any rate, just accept that you are wearing full adamantite plate armor, despite how it appears. Even the fabric of your skirts provide the same protection as enchanted adamantite plate. The reason why your talent doesn't detect this is due to it being fashioned with highly advanced, yet mundane, crafting skills. It was an impossible balance of form and functionality. Not only would a local smith dismiss claims of such armor as the product of drunken fancy, but the full extent of what those alterations entailed was severely understated. It did not weigh as much as a full suit of plate mail and had all of its padding requirements covered by her bodysuit, gloves and stockings. It restricted her movement no more than one of the light summer dresses that Leanne liked to wear. Though it probably wasn't a concern for her, the problems with ventilation that heavy armor users experienced were non-existent. Perhaps the most noteworthy aspect was that a full helm had been turned into a circlet. As a melee combatant and, more importantly, as a commander, she enjoyed a full field of view while also receiving the protection of a great helm. The equipment might have been fashioned to appeal to certain aesthetics, but it offered outrageous advantages simply by being what it was. If this armor is essentially enchanted adamantite heavy plate, Ludmilla asked, does that also mean attacks that can normally penetrate that enchanted plate will also penetrate the protection offered by this equipment? That's right, the Sorcerer King answered. An opponent like Shiltir could easily punch through your armor. The damaged equipment will repair itself after she withdraws her weapon, of course, but you will have taken the damage delivered by the strike. People wielding steel weapons against steel armor is common enough around here, but equipment parity in fights above level 20 or so is quite rare. Generally speaking, one must consider an opponent's equipment, what classes they might have and the possibility that they will employ sundering attacks. In short, the nuances of her equipment and how they applied to every scenario were not something that one could provide an easy answer for. Understanding that there were limits to its protection was helpful, but she would need to figure out where her defensive boundaries lay. Those boundaries would also shift as she grew in strength, so it was something she had to constantly ensure her awareness of. Well, since you're the intuitive type, the Sorcerer King waved a hand beside his head, it's better to figure things out through direct experience, yes? The difference between what you're accustomed to and what you now use is so vast that many facts cannot be grasped by simply hearing them described. According to our maps, there should be another ruin about a day's journey further downriver. If the levels of the undead continue to increase the deeper we go into the Katza Plains, then our next stop should present you and your forces with a wider variety of challenges. I look forward to your performance. The Sorcerer King's presence receded, accompanied by the whisper of his luxurious robes. The sound of Lady Shultier's metal heels on the deck tapped away after him. Ludmilla re-equipped her glaive, turning to resume her silent vigil. I look forward to your performance. Her grip tightened on the haft of her weapon. After all that he had done for her, she could not disappoint his majesty.